Well, hello. My name is Brian Wheeler, and I'm executive director of Charlottesville Tomorrow. And we're a nonprofit that covers growth, development, public education, local politics here in Charlottesville and Albemarle County. And on behalf of the Virginia Foundation for Humanities and the producer of the Virginia Festival of Books, welcome. I'm glad you're here. So Charlottesville Tomorrow is pleased to have been a media sponsor of the festival over the past three years. And we know the festival always brings together people who are passionate about reading and being informed. And we believe informed citizens create better communities. Uh, so the festival is a great partner for Charlottesville Tomorrow in achieving that goal. Many of you who are here locally know us through our partnership with the Daily Progress. And over the past five years, we've published about 1,400 news stories in the newspaper on key quality of life issues. And we're now 62, 62% of the newspaper's content on those topics. Um, if you want to learn more about our work, we've got a table just outside the, the door. Our newsroom is just down the hall, so this is our office. We welcome you here. And it's also the office of the Piedmont Council for the Arts and they are one of the uh, hosts uh, for this event today. So we want to thank them. All right, so at my far right, Andy Burstein is the author of the book here today, Democracy's Muse, How Thomas Jefferson Became an FDR Liberal, a Reagan Republican, and a Tea Party Fanatic, all while being dead. <laughs> He's the Charles P. Manship Professor of History at Louisiana State University. He's a recognized Jefferson Scholar, the author of numerous books about the founding era in American history, and a frequent contributor to Salon.com. He was also a consultant to Ken Burns and appeared in the PBS documentary Thomas Jefferson. And he's now uh, owner of a condominium here in Charlottesville, so <laughs> he has a view of uh, Monticello from, from his new abode. Next to me is uh, Jason Grumet. Jason is author of City of Rivals and is president of the Bipartisan Policy Center, which promotes practical solutions to the country's public policy challenges. He has a bachelor's degree from Brown University and a law degree from Harvard. So welcome to both of you. Andy, why don't you start us out? All right. <clears throat> um, if you uh, just... You can tell the book by its cover. Uh, the Andy Warhol thing, um, I like it, uh, because it does tend to capture um, the insouciance of, uh, for me anyway, talking about modern politics. Um, I'm used to talking about Jefferson in his own time. Uh, my partner Nancy uh, and I uh, wrote Madison and Jefferson uh, our magnum opus, a 600-plus page uh, uh, story, a saga of uh, a 50-year personal and political alliance. And prior to that, I wrote Jefferson's Secrets, Death and Desire at Monticello, which um, uh, deals with Jefferson in retirement, looking back on life, and it's kind of uh, uh, an emotional portrait of Jefferson. So I've spent a lot of years trying to uh, understand Jefferson in historical context. And this book uh, is different um, because I'm mostly interested in how modern politicians have embraced Jefferson and in, in many cases mangled Jefferson. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the inspiration, I guess there's a, a twofold inspiration for, for researching and writing this book. And uh, the first uh, uh, is that uh, I get letters and emails from people who uh, you know, read my other work on Jefferson, and they say things like, if Jefferson were alive today, how would he feel about gays in the military? <laughs> <laughs> so if Jefferson were alive today, uh, uh, seems to be a good way uh, of, of, of bridging the gap between um, early American history Oh, okay. Uh, am I am I being heard in the back? No. 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 Okay. I don't think your well, mic is working. Let me check. Yeah, it's working. All right. I'll I'll speak louder anyway. 
I'm, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. I can speak loud. <laughs> I, I, I have a, a class with almost 200 students in it. Um, most of whom don't want to be there because it's a required course in survey of early American history. Okay. Um, I can tell I'm louder now. Uh, so that and uh, pro uh, Professor, that was good. Um, President Kennedy's iconic remarks in April of 1962 when he spoke uh, at a White House banquet that he himself organized. Usually the social secretary or Jackie uh, would organize White House events, but this was one that, that President Kennedy really wanted to do himself. Um, uh, and uh, uh, before the, the 49 uh, Nobel laureates, um, he uh, gave those, I, I'm sure you all certainly, uh, Charlottesvillians know this, um, uh, the, the, the greatest you know, concentration, uh, I'm not looking at my notes, so um, I'm paraphrasing, the greatest concentration of genius um, to uh, uh, come to the White House since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. <laughs> and when I saw at uh, the National Portrait Gallery, there was a, an exhibition uh, about eight or ten years ago, and uh, I saw the notes uh, from which Kennedy, in his own hand, uh, ad-libbed these lines. And that is uh, one illustration in the book, um, along with a political book that I had when I was a graduate student here. Um, you'll, some of you will remember um, 1993 when President William Jefferson Clinton um, uh, began his inaugural proceedings from, you know, by, uh, by riding his horse from Monticello to, no, that was Jefferson, <laughs> riding, <laughs> riding a bus from Monticello uh, to Washington to begin the inaugural festivities. And the, and the political button, which is also uh, an illustration of the book, uh, it has a picture of uh, Jefferson and Clinton, um, and it says Jeffersonian democracy, um, suggesting the, the, the language on the button suggests uh, that it's a continuation of, uh, of uh, Jeffersonian democracy. It, it does literally say that. Um, so the chronology um, of the book, which I'll give you just briefly, uh, starts with the New Deal, starts with Franklin Roosevelt and the 200th anniversary of Jefferson's birth, April 13th, 1943, when the Jefferson Memorial was dedicated. And Roosevelt um, not only sat with the architect and looked at drawings and had a hand in determining the, the, the domed appearance of the Jefferson Memorial, um, but uh, was party to the discussions um, with the experts uh, who were on hand uh, for this project. It took a, uh, the better part of a decade to complete. Um, uh, to determine what would be the Jefferson quotations in the Jefferson Memorial. And so the one that we all uh, know um, that's wrapped around the, the, the interior uh, of the dome, um, I have sworn on the altar of God eternal hostility, every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Think about 1943, uh, we're fighting the Nazis. And um, these kind of uh, Jefferson quotes are, are used and have been used uh, from the New Deal forward. Every president, not everyone, but most presidents have engaged with Jefferson in one way or the other. Um, the 41st, 42nd, 43rd, and 44th presidents all have portraits of Jefferson in the White House cabinet room. Um, uh, Eisenhower was the last to have William Howard Taft uh, <laughs> up there. And Ronald Reagan, curiously enough, uh, talk about strange bedfellows, which I guess is, I, I could wait that that's a good segue <laughs> to, um, to Jason's talk. But um, uh, Reagan had Thomas Jefferson uh, appearing next to Calvin Coolidge. And somehow he find, found those two politically compatible. Well, this is the malleability of Thomas Jefferson that I'm talking about in this book. Um, I, I, I start with the uh, 200th anniversary and the uh, consecration, shall we call it, of the Jefferson Memorial. Um, 
Uh, but it really goes back to 1924, when Franklin Roosevelt, as a uh, failed vice presidential candidate, wrote the first and only book review of his life. And it was of Claude Bowers's Jefferson and Hamilton, The Struggle for American Democracy, uh, in which this Indiana Democrat, um, uh, you know, an intellectual, wrote uh, that throughout American history, um, the party, the two-party conflict, has been, in effect, whether uh, Jefferson or Hamilton would prevail. And in the 1920s, when Roosevelt was writing, Hamilton was prevailing um, in the popular moment. That Hamilton representing the moneyed, uh, closely tied to power and government. Jefferson, in this cons construct, representing um, <coughs> the common man. And that was embraced by the Democratic Party out of power in the t Republican 1920s. Um, that one book was so successful um, among avid Democratic politicians that its author, I mean, how many times have we heard of a historian or biographer being selected to give the keynote address at the Democratic National Convention, <laughs> but um, before 10,000 listeners in Houston in 1928 when Al Smith was nominated. Um, and uh, Franklin Roosevelt placed his fellow New Yorker, Al Smith, in nomination. It was Claude Bowers, the author, who gave the stirring uh, keynote address at the convention. So, uh, you know, this is where it begins. Harry Truman called Thomas Jefferson my most, uh, my favorite character in American history. Um, uh, Jackie Kennedy said he's uh, the president with whom I uh, have the most in common. I think that's, uh, I may have gotten that a little off, but, um, you know, uh, her redesign of the White House, uh, she brought in Julian Boyd, the uh, editor, founding editor of the papers of Thomas Jefferson. Um, uh, uh, Julian Boyd's uh, successor is, is in the audience here. Um, my friend recently retired. Uh, Jefferson scholar, Barbara Ober. Um, she flew in from Los Angeles last night, so I had to give a shout out to Barbara. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, you know, but calling in the, 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 the uh, editor of the Jefferson Papers to help in the design uh, of the White House and uh, to, to redesign uh, you know, what titles will be featured in the library uh, in the Kennedy administration so that it reflected the Jeffersonian democracy. What happened in, um, I'm, I'm looking at the, the watch here, so um, I want to uh, tempt you as much as I can. Um, uh, what happened in 1980 is that Ronald Reagan seized the Jefferson narrative, and it was Jefferson uh, who can be quoted uh, all over the place as a small government conservative. Um, Reagan adored Jefferson, perhaps even more than Roosevelt and Kennedy did, and Truman. Um, and uh, he gave, and I believe it was 1987, uh, uh, a, a thoroughgoing address at the Jefferson Memorial, which he called his Economic Bill of Rights. And again, it enshrined that small government Jefferson, the one who, who would not uh, uh, take money out of the pockets of, of, of citizens. Um, who didn't believe in taxing. Um, now, what this has led to, of course, um, is uh, what I call Jefferson abuse uh, on Capitol Hill, <laughs> where congressmen on both sides of the aisle, um, but in recent years, it's, it's definitely more the Republicans or the Tea Party Republicans, um, who will uh, uh, excerpt Jefferson quotations that may or may not be actual Jefferson quotations <laughs> and use it to show that if Jefferson were alive today, he would be um, a small government conservative Republican. Uh, the Democrats have largely remained silent, at least on Capitol Hill, when it comes to... So, so in a way, this whole book is, uh, poses the question, uh, who owns Jefferson, the left or the right? And uh, the answer to the question 
uh, I'm not giving anything away, is uh, neither the left nor the right own Jefferson. The past owns Jefferson. And uh, the role of the historian is to um, encourage people to understand uh, historical context and not um, uh, sort of uh, for partisan uh, opportunism, for, for political gain, uh, insist that, that Jeff what Jefferson meant when the United States had one one hundredth the population it has today. The small government for a small country does not mean that he would have been a small government conservative today. We cannot extract him from his time. I mean, I think this is probably obvious to everyone in the audience. So, um, uh, uh, I'm almost at, at 10 minutes now, and I think um, um, we'd probably like to have more time for audience participation, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to wrap this up uh, in another minute or two. Uh, Jefferson is the closest, you know, what, why Jefferson? Why not? Why does Jefferson have this special uh, relationship to American exceptionalism, to the kind of political discourse that we engage in today? Why do we care that his DNA showed up uh, where it shouldn't? Um, uh, Jefferson's the closest to flesh and blood among the founders. Um, George Washington works best in marble. <laughs> he is statuesque, but he didn't say anything that's really quotable. Well, I shouldn't say anything, but uh, his, uh, he was not an intellectual. He was more or less on the sidelines um, after uh, 1769 when he was kind of a radical um, in, in, in suggesting that uh, America and the mother country might end up in a, a hot war before too long. Uh, some of his correspondence, private correspondence, suggests that. But, uh, uh, but as president, um, certainly, uh, Washington was not particularly uh, articulate. And um, uh, James Madison, although in our book Nancy and I show that this, this is wrong, but uh, his historical reputation is that he's to be seen in cerebral terms alone and that uh, whatever partisan statements, uh, whatever um, uh, personality comes through after 1789 is less relevant than what he wrote in the Federalist Papers. And so he's kind of stuck in the American imagination uh, in that moment uh, early in his political career. John Adams is colorful, um, uh, often prescient, but not inspirational. It's Jefferson whose language, and Hamilton, how can I forget Alex, uh, was, uh, you know, really uh, uh, too full of himself um, uh, uh, controversial, yes, but condescending, dismissive, and uh, about as far as you can get from a hip-hop artist. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you understand that analogy. Um, uh, so he hated any kind of popular enthusiasm. He wasn't interested in talking to the common man at all. And his writing was turgid. There's really nothing beautiful in anything that Alexander Hamilton wrote. So Jefferson, you know, maybe he was lucky with the Declaration of Independence, uh, that he got tapped to write what turns out to be America's long-form birth certificate. Um, uh, but his first inaugural address, uh, Roosevelt, Kennedy, and Reagan all uh, drew upon uh, the language, whether it, the, the liberal humanism that's in there, and uh, you know Reagan in particular, the wise and frugal government, that's a direct phrasing of Jefferson's, the wise and frugal government that would not uh, you know, take money out of the pockets of uh, citizens, that it was, you know, government should do only as much as needed and stay out of people's lives. Uh, so you can find beautiful sentiments that talk about the human condition in a way that makes us feel that, boy, if only the, the Enlightenment could be you know, reinvigorated today. Well, 
Um, uh, if we really want to talk about American exceptionalism, um, we were exceptionally speculative, ex <laughs> exceptionally in debt. Uh, all of our uh, founders, pretty much, except Washington, because he was a nasty landlord, and you didn't want to be uh, renting from Washington and owing him money. Uh, so, um, gosh, I don't know quite how to uh, how to wrap this up, but I know I have to because it's it's 15 minutes now. So um, I'll try to think up some more zingers, and meanwhile, yield the floor. Thank you. Sounds good. Do you want to dive in? All right. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. You know, as a, an author, um, you spend hundreds or thousands of hours writing what you hope are interesting things, and then you get invited sometimes to come talk about them. And I have been before a delightful mix of audiences, including six people at a Barnes & Noble, <laughs> four of whom were actually in the Starbucks kind of half-hearted <laughs> at their neck. And so this is really, uh, really delightful, I think a real testament to the history and work uh, of this festival. Um, Andrew's written a, a fabulous book, and it really is also a terrific uh, precedent for uh, what I'm going to try to talk about, which you know, leaps forward to the bone-crushing gridlock that is our current moment, um, but tries to provide uh, an optimistic view that is neither grounded in false nostalgia or, I think, wildly optimistic and unrealistic. And I run an organization called the Bipartisan Policy Center, which I started about seven years ago with the uh, tremendous help from four former Senate Majority Leaders, Tom Daschle, Howard Baker, Bob Dole, and George Mitchell. And our aspiration uh, was to try to revive the dark art of principled compromise, which has for about 240 years actually enabled the United States to come up with both broadly embraced and resilient public policy. Um, I'd like to stress that we are the bipartisan policy center, not the nonpartisan policy center, <laughs> the postpartisan policy center, there's a metapartisan policy center. In California, there's a movement for transpartisanship, which uh, I'm, not, I'm not making this stuff up. And I'm, <laughs> but our imagination uh, is that it's the constructive collision of ideas between proud, self-righteous partisans sitting across the table from people who absolutely disagree with them. That is, in fact, the stuff of democracy. And that the essence of that is, in fact, um, alive and well. And so, you know, many times people try to um, argue that there are things that, you know, um, in theory will also work in practice. This book tries to make the opposite point and see if I could ground what works in practice in a larger narrative of our democratic theory. Um, just a moment on Jefferson. He embedded these miraculous, crazy tensions in our democracy, um, which no other nation has ever tried to emulate. In fact, when we go and try to bring democracy to other countries, not always successful endeavor, we don't even suggest a version of American democracy. And so I think part of what is so remarkable and probably accessible about Jefferson is his ability to kind of conceptualize these tensions in our Constitution. And, you know, from my standpoint, our founders were incredible optimists. They imagined a system of government that could only work if people who didn't know each other, lived near each other, looked like each other, or like each other, could in fact work together. Our system of government forces the majority and the minority to collaborate, which is fundamentally different than a parliamentary system. And um, you know, the point of this book is not some kind of, you know, imagination of the old 1780s. Our nation has always been partisan. You know, this is not a kind of kumbaya country, nor is democracy a sport that lacks aggression. You don't have to look back, though, to the 1780s. You all remember the Clinton years. Modern history, in fact, we may have another round. Um, <laughs> politics of personal destruction. The government shutdown that lasted about 40 days with Clinton and Gingrich. The Lewinsky scandal. They impeached the guy. While they were impeaching President Clinton, they were still legislating. Committees were meeting. Within three weeks of being impeached, President Clinton was signing pieces of legislation. Which means that while all of that was going on, they still had the capacity 
to go into another room to set aside some of those antagonisms and figure out how to move the country forward. Um, I have not been able to actually um, source this, but I am told that the night of his impeachment, President Clinton called Speaker Gingrich to talk about an unrelated piece of legislation. A different moment. Now, you, know, you have to recognize that Clinton, of course, was a unique figure. Um, Trent Lott, who we work with a lot, uh, told me a story that I put in the book. Um, and was, you know, Trent Lott was the former majority leader, you know, conservative Republican from Mississippi. And the phone rings about 2 a.m. And Trent likes to go to sleep about 9.30. Um, and his wife picks up the phone. And, I, and I, this is unfair. I picture him in one of those like crisp pajama suits with one of those hats on. <laughs> I, I know that's wrong, but it's just in my mind's eye I thought I would share. And it's a call from the president. And so his wife you know, fumbles with the phone and hands it to uh, Senator Lott. And for the next several minutes, you know, Trent says, he says, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Mr. President. Well, that's a, that's a fine point, Mr. President. Yes, I will. But we'll, we'll try to get right on that, Mr. President. Yes, sir, Mr. President. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you, Mr. President. And his wife says, you know, Trent, what the heck was that? And he says, I'm not sure. I think it might have had something to do with Latin America. <laughs> Clinton was just always working the system. And that is part of the reason why the nation has had the ability to kind of metabolize the aggression that is essential in a democracy and still get things done. And I am going to suggest to you that there are a number of ways that we could help start to restore that ability. Um, the first thing I want to do is spend a couple minutes uh, helping you understand why you're so pissed off. Because um, <laughs> the system is not working, which is frustrating. But none of the cures, none of the suggested solutions seem to gain any traction either, which is just disillusioning. A part of my optimism is to suggest that those solutions actually aren't going to work. There's somewhat of a misdiagnosis. It's not that they're flat wrong, but they tend to lead you to box canyons or kind of you know, inactionable ideas. So I've suggested that the, there's this kind of unholy trinity of critique. There's money, media, and mandering of a Jerry nature. I, I like the <laughs> you have to bear with me. None of these are new. And so let me just give you, you know, a couple of examples. You know, so, We've always had money in politics. Yes, it is a problem. Part of the reason it's a problem is that while it's still inadequately transparent, it's way more transparent than it's ever been before. It's not the bags of cash that were you know, showing up next to Lyndon Johnson's office. Um, you know, Senator Kennedy, um, when he was uh, elected, you know, read a telegram from his father saying, you know, now John, you know, don't you get any more votes than you need. Damn if I'm going to pay for a landslide. <laughs> um, but the broader point is not to suggest that money in politics is not incredibly <coughs> challenging and in many ways corrosive. We have something called the Supreme Court. They call it the Supreme Court for a reason. Everybody I know is deeply upset with some decision that the Supreme Court has made in the last several years about something, whether you're on the left, center, or right. Um, the Supreme Court is very clear in its interpretation that money is a form of speech. And regardless of what you think about the argument, that's not going to change anytime soon. There are a number of people who imagine constitutional conventions. I think Andrew's even written about this. Um, I'm happy to see that happen um, with some caveat. You know, when you open up the Constitution, you, usually, you have to open up the whole thing, not just the parts you don't like. And when we talk about the dysfunction of this current crowd, I'm not entirely sure I would want to you know, change the judgment of the folks in the 1780s, but it's just not going to happen anytime soon. So we can complain about it, um, but there's a little bit of a howling at the moon challenge there. You know, you think about the money in politics and see if we might be able to shift it in some ways that are constitutional. The media. Thank you. <laughs> it, it's always been bad. <laughs> it's different. But, you know, actually, I have a, a quick story, which I'm sure I got wrong and will now be corrected publicly, about the election between uh, Jefferson and Adams. You know, two statesmen, 1800. You know, people we think back on as the great pillars of our democracy. Um, the media organization um, supporting Jefferson described Adams as of a horrible hermaphroditic nature, who had neither the firmness of a man nor the sensibilities of a woman. <laughs> 
Adams essentially responded that if Jefferson were elected, um, you know, rape, murder, and all sorts of horrible things would occur, and these streets would be rent with blood. The Sean Hannity, Rachel Maddow differences in that <laughs> context. Um, but again, bigger point, what are you going to do about it? Right? I mean, the media is responding to technology and to who we are and to what we want. Complain all you want, but if you're frustrated, you should be, you're not going to get anywhere. Gerrymandering a little more complicated, it does matter. It is corrosive to the democracy to have the politicians choosing the voters rather than the voters choosing the politicians. It doesn't matter as much as most people think. Because we have self-sorted ourselves as a nation, what you can think of as an organic gerrymandering. My favorite poll of all times is called the Whole Foods Cracker Barrel Poll. <laughs> when President Obama um, was elected for the first time in 2008, they did a poll. 81% of the people who voted for President Obama lived in a county with the Whole Foods. 36% lived in a county with the Cracker Barrel. Fast forward two years to 2010 when the Republicans swept the Democrats out of the House of Representatives. 82% of the members of Congress who lost that election, the Democrats, lived in a county with a Cracker Barrel. Um, further studies have suggested that there were probably six or eight seats in that election that were influenced by the kind of competitive gerrymandering. Um, it could affect the kinds of candidates who get elected in primaries. You know, I strongly support the idea of bipartisan redistricting commissions. I mean, it, I'm not saying it's good. I'm just suggesting that if we fixed gerrymandering, the best we could aspire to is the Senate. No districts in the Senate, not exactly a you know, bastion of collaboration, <laughs> enthusiasm, and public spirit. So it matters. But none of these three uh, options are really going to move the country, I think, in the way we want to go. And so a lot of my book is suggesting um, a set of what I hope are more practical ideas that you know, none of which unto themselves are epiphanies, but that could start kind of a virtuous cycle to return us to a greater sense of function. Um, and again, we've got to you know, keep our aspirations reasonable. You know, in the Clinton years, 50% of the Congress, I'm sorry, 50% of the public broadly approved of government. So half still thought it stunk, right? And that's what we're shooting for, right? We're not looking for 98%. <laughs> that's not what America's about. 9% doesn't work. But anything between 30 and 50 usually gives you functional government. So in terms of what uh, I propose, it kind of falls into a nature-nurture um, split. We got to think about the nature of the people we bring to Washington. And so we need to think a lot about election reform. Um, right now, about 20% of people vote in primary elections. That inherently means that you're trying to turn out the extremes on both sides. And it makes the contests more partisan, and it makes the people who get elected more partisan. So we need to work on turning out uh, more voters. Our registration system's a mess. You know, there's a big fight right now between access and uh, security. Um, concerns about disenfranchisement. 25% of the um, folks who should be voting are not registered. One in a big people who are registered are registered wrong. There is an accuracy problem in our electoral system. It's more on the registration side than on the electoral side. But um, we have these really great things that they call computers, <laughs> which are rarely used in many of our state's election systems. We're still filling out pieces of paper at the DMV. And you know, the fact that you know, Jeff Bezos from Amazon is going to deliver a pizza to your house by drone, <laughs> and your county election official doesn't know whether you're living or dead, suggests an asymmetry um, that we should focus on. We need to have more opportunities for early voting. Um, we propose, a, in my organization in the book, a national primary day. Most people don't even know that the primary is happening in the off-year elections, let alone make a conscious decision not to vote. We have elections on Tuesdays. <laughs> So um, Chris Rock, the comedian, um, has a little you know, bit where he says, you know why we have elections on Tuesday? Because they don't want us to vote. Right. Which, you know, for people who are working a couple of jobs, it's a crazy time to have a national election. We should have a national election holiday, or at least move the election uh, to a weekend, or provide enough early voting opportunities um, to encourage that kind of participation. But I think the bulk of what I write about really is on the nurture side. And some of these ideas may be intuitive. I think a number of them somewhat counterintuitive. On the intuitive side, Congress just needs to spend more time together. We have this kind of self-loathing legislature, which desperately tries to become members of Congress and then pretends that at the soonest moment, what they want to do is you know, get the heck out of town. Um, 
Um, a lot of members of Congress elected in the last two cycles don't own homes, don't even rent apartments. They sleep on the couches in their offices. Now, partly this is because we underpay you know, our members of Congress. Um, we do. We do. If you have to maintain two homes in two different cities, um, we do. Um, but part of it is their desire to suggest that they have nothing to do with the country they're supposed to govern. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's kind of creepy to have you know 30, 40 members of Congress you know, sleeping on their couches. Um, <laughs> last year we had Congress in session for 97 days. They just need to be around more. And Mitch McConnell, to his credit, has brought back the four-day work week, the idea that they should spend four days to five days a week working and then a week off, you know, doing what they need to do in their districts. Um, that's a very good sign. Uh, a remarkable idea is to actually have the House and the Senate in session at the same time. <laughs> this is a little bit of a, a new idea of late, and so that's where, so we're making some strides in that direction. Um, so here's maybe a little bit of the counterintuitive. We need members of Congress to take more trips together. We don't need them to go you know, golfing with Jack Abramoff, <laughs> right? But the pendulum has swung too far in the other direction. If you ask any of the folks I work with, they will tell you that they make friends just the same way we do. It's the 15-hour flight to Kazakhstan where you realize that you both had hip replacements and you have a lot in common. <laughs> Lindsey Graham, a great story, flying over to Afghanistan um, with Vice President Biden. This was when they were really battling over this question of the Afghan troop surge, and Biden and Graham were on opposite sides of the argument. And so Senator Graham said, it was a little awkward, but they sat down together, you know, long flight. And just to get, you know, break the ice, he says, so, you know, Joe, actually, you know, how'd you get into politics? And as the flight was landing in Kandahar 17 hours later, Biden said, well, Lindsay, I guess we're going to have to leave it there. <laughs> but I'm happy to tell you the rest on the way back. <laughs> we need to find ways to encourage and enable members of Congress to take trips together. I suggest that you know, committees should have formal sanctioned trips, and everyone should be expected to go on at least one a year. But there are lots of different ways to think about that. The place where I've probably kicked up the most dust is on this question of transparency. Everyone, what's, what could possibly be wrong with transparency? Well, it's really hard to make um, decisions when you're naked. So the opposite of transparency is not corruption. It's privacy. And these are both values in our society. I, I try to convey this sometimes with my own personal experience. My wife and I occasionally discuss um, whose parents we're going to visit for Thanksgiving. The conversations would be different if our in-laws were in the room. <laughs> and this is a dynamic that members of Congress are actually suffering with. The um, mistrust we have of Congress makes us want to see everything. It's extremely difficult to venture a collaborative idea to move away from orthodoxy if your most aggressive critics are staring over your shoulder. And so we've got to turn the C-SPAN cameras off every once in a while. We need to encourage committees to sometimes meet in private without suggesting that they're doing you know, the country ill will. Um, you know, there are a number of well-intended laws, you know, government in the sunshine, which is all public meetings have to happen in public if you have a quorum. Regardless of the process, folks will tell you those meetings don't work. So they're either forced to not make decisions or go behind the backs of their own rules and have little mini-meetings where they don't have quorums and then do shell diplomacy back and forth. So again, we just need to find a balance. I'm not suggesting we should have government in the dark, but sunshine can actually scorch the democracy. Um, wrapping up. Wrapping up. Ethics. Um, I love ethics. Abramoff was a crook. You rarely actually constrain criminals with more rules. We have some just nutty rules. Um, there's a 15-page memo, which I described, which um, distinguishes between the fact that members of Congress and staff can accept baseball caps, but not coffee mugs. <laughs> A staff of mine spent um, 15 hours having the question when he was at the Treasury Department of whether he could accept a coffee mug. He thinks the general counsel's office spent about $1,000 determining whether this $5.99 mug was acceptable and eventually he got it back. But my last story um, is something called the toothpick rule. We have decided that um, sitting down for a meal, if there's a lobbyist in the room, is gateway graft. It's going to lead members of Congress to um, you know, great and uh, unscrupulous activities. And so the rule now is if you uh, have an organization that hires any lobbyists and have members of Congress come to a conversation, a lunch, a reception, the food cannot be bigger than um, that which can fit on a toothpick. You can't sit down and eat. 
And so I went to a reception a few years ago. Can't remember where or what it was about, but I got there early by mistake, half an hour early instead of half an hour late. Looked forward, and there was just this crazy scene at the buffet table of you know these guys in you know, $1,200 suits, kind of like hacking away at the food while the caterer looked on with this abject horror. And having nothing to do, I walked up and found out that the general counsel for the association had determined that the food was unethically large. <laughs> and so they were beating the crap out of it to make it you know, legal. We've lost sight of some of the big issues, is my larger point. And I think that you know, we don't need a Mars invasion or a constitutional convention. Um, we just need a set of kind of constructive small steps that bring a little momentum back to the system. Thanks. I think we should jump right to your questions. So if somebody wants to raise their hand, I'll repeat the question just so everyone hears it. Yeah. I have a couple of them, but I'll just ask one and then wait for maybe the time. So let's see. Um, the second gentleman, the second speaker. Um, term limits. How are you talking about fellowship and, and legislators getting to know each other? How does term limits fit into that? So question for Jason, how do term limits fit into the future of Washington for you? So I don't like term limits. Um, I think the reason we have a democracy is for people to choose their representatives. Um, we have some incredibly wonderful members of Congress who I would not want to kick out. Um, we have some terrible members of Congress that I think we should all kick out. Um, but the practical issue, and it depends on how long obviously, what term limits do is empower the staff. The members come and go, the staff are forever, and it does not often diminish that kind of entrenchment. Um, you know, Virginia has a new governor every four years. I think that's a hot mess. I mean, you guys live it, but um, there are several who I wish would have had two or three terms, and some not. So it, it seems to me unnecessarily arbitrary. Right. Yes. <laughs> my professor voice. Sounds good. <laughs> A quick comment for um, Mr. Grummet. You were saying that members of Congress, and then I have a question for the professor, uh, don't have a place to stay and they stay in their offices. I think your program should um, start organizing um, congressional dorms for members of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned <laughs> Norm Ornstein <laughs> argues that very point. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay, my question for Mr. Burstein is, um, what is the fascination, in your experience, with the use of history or abuse? Margaret McMillan wrote a, a series of talks about the uses and abuses of history. And your, your example about Thomas Jefferson being used by everybody, or at least the selective use, what do you see in American history or your experience makes the use, the selective use of history something that politicians <coughs> like to grab onto? Uh, it's a complicated question. I'll give you a simple answer for it. <laughs> um, which is not to say it's the only way to answer the question. But um, every country needs a national origins story, some way to derive pride in the essence of the culture, the political culture. And for us, it's you know, the magic moment of July 4th, 1776, Jefferson's association is with that. Um, uh, Americans have always felt a need to commemorate, whether it's national holidays. And a lot of these, uh, you know, the, the apocryphal <coughs> stories um, tend to have a larger role than actual history, which is a difficult thing for us as historians to try to remedy. So that, just as a simple example of this, um, uh, the Pilgrim's Thanksgiving. Uh, Abraham Lincoln established the national holiday of Thanksgiving. And the reason it's the turkey is not because that's what the Indians were out there 
bringing to the table, but because the turkey industry in, 18, in the 1860s was young and needed government support. <laughs> and the yam industry was right behind it. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, aside from the, the, uh, uh, the hermaphroditic quote uh, is apocryphal. Uh, some, some wait, 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 calendar, you, calendar, and, and, calendar. Well, calendar invoked that illusion when he, but when he was attacking John Adams. And who were you? <laughs> <laughs> I feared that. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> yep. Um, this is for um, Andy. One of the issues that uh, we seem to, but we just have to understand is where we found it as a Christian nation. And Jefferson, some people find, was a Christian. Right. And other people don't. Can you comment on, you know, well, that I, particular part of it? Yeah, I've commented. Yeah. Oh, so the Christian nation, yeah, the, uh, the association of Jefferson these days with the uh, Christian nation debate. Um, and evangelicals uh, have been bending over backwards, especially David Barton uh, in the Jefferson Lies, which was pulled from the shelves. Um, but uh, he's still very active in uh, on, on the religious right and um, uh, is is uh, welcome in Washington. I know um, the, it's it's really a stretch. Jefferson, in his own time, um, in fact, the election of 1800 centered uh, more on his. Uh, ostensible atheism, that's what he was accused of. Um, and uh, Henry S. Randall, who wrote the author, authorized biography for the Jefferson granddaughters in 1858, which was really, it's a wonderful, wonderful biography, but it's terribly um, uh, one-sided. And he devotes uh, uh, like the last 50 pages of the book to discussing why Jefferson was really a Christian. And he's trying to, because Jefferson's granddaughters were Christians, and they were trying to, uh, shall we say, resurrect uh, a <laughs> Christian Jefferson, who truly believed that uh, every American within two generations of his would die a Unitarian. He said that directly. <laughs> so uh, I, without belaboring it here, I have an, an entire chapter on the culture wars and on, one is on race and one is on religion, and um, I get into quite a lot of detail about how Jefferson and Christianity um, have been used and misused uh, throughout the whole period of the 20th and early 21st centuries. Uh, yep. What about the idea that corporations are people? How does that affect the money in politics? So the question is, what about corporations as people and free speech and politics? So that is you know, one more basis for the torrents of money flowing into our system. And um, I am not here to defend the torrents of money flowing into our system, but I am standing on the banks of the river, and I see that there's a torrent of money flowing into the system. And so, you know, we all have the option to try to stand there in the river or hold back the money, which is what a lot of um, reform-minded people try to do. Not working. Don't think it's going to work. Or we can try to steer the river at least a little bit. You know, the biggest challenge we have with money that I believe is fixable is the dark money, right? The fact that corporations or any individuals with billions of dollars or millions of dollars can set up these kind of shell organizations that um, don't disclose their donors. And you won't be surprised to know that they run the nastiest ads because there's no accountability. You know, Reince Prabus and Debbie Washington Schultz, who run the RNC and the DNC, could never run some of the commercials that these non-disclosed super PACs run. There was a study at Wesleyan University looks at ads, and they found that 50% um, of the candidate ads were positive and 50% negative. 90% of the party ads were positive, surprisingly. 90% of the third party ads were negative. Now, I'm not suggesting that if the third party ads went away, the parties would stay quite as positive. I think there was no room left in the negative category for them. But disclosure is constitutional. 
Justice Scalia supports disclosure. And so I think that's a step that would in fact start to bring more um, legitimacy back to the parties. And if you're comparing the parties to the super PACs and the C4s, you want to stick with the parties. Okay, question so for- So get rid of the super PACs and the C4s. That's that constitution again getting in the way. <laughs> That, that's that constitution, again, getting in the way, at least as interpreted by the Supreme Court. As interpreted by? The, the suggestion was, should we just get rid of those super PACs? And again, if um, we didn't have a democracy with a constitution, I could be convinced that that was a fantastic idea. But it's a lifetime appointment to the court, and I, I think it's a great thing to advocate. Just, just don't um, only advocate that, because you're going to have a really bad time between now and whenever that happens. <laughs> Yeah, we got him going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you want to finish your thought? Can yes. I ask an official question then? <laughs> Instead of just making comments on the phone? Go for it. <laughs> what I'm saying is, what, what, I, what I wanted to say is, the Constitution did not say we must have super PACs. This is an interpretation of the Constitution. And many of us, including some of the things you're saying, whether you truly believe them or not, are, well... That's the way it is. Can't change any of it. In other words, because it's not written as words in the Constitution. It's stuff that has evolved. So it can evolve in a different way. So you make a broad point and I think uh, raise a practical issue. You know, the broad point is whether you want to be a literalist about the Constitution. And I would argue that that's not in our national interest. Of course this has to be elaborated and interpreted. We created a system to elaborate and interpret it. And the final arbiter of those elaborations is the Supreme Court of the United States of America. And so, you know, one thing I learned in law school is you take your victim as you find it, right? This is who we are and where we are. And I strongly believe that we could um, benefit from you know, some different members of the Supreme Court. I have a lot of friends who believe that we should benefit from some other different members of the Supreme Court. You know, it's just here we are, I guess, is my larger point. Okay, I know we have a couple of hands up over here. I'm going to start right here and then I'm going to work my way back to the two of you. As regards their decision in that matter, um, I suppose you know what the, how they pulled from the Constitution to come up with their uh, response. But do they ever apply just logic? <laughs> I mean, couldn't they have called in some esteemed philosophers and talked so about So the, the question for the lawyer of the panel is, <laughs> is the Supreme Court logical? Or, or, or is it allowed, is it allowed is it to allowed? actually seek logic? And I need to note that I did graduate from law school, but it took seven years and I never took a bar exam. So <laughs> take this with a grain of salt. Um, there's a school of um, legal theory called legal realism, which basically argues that we should bring more practical um, conclusion to the question because, of course, we're interpreting a document that's you know, a couple hundred years old. Some of the Supreme Court feels more that way, some are more um, literalists, but to make it seem a little less crazy, you know, what they basically say is people should be allowed to participate in the democratic process. Some people have a lot of time. We shouldn't in any way limit the amount of time, emotion, energy that someone brings into that process. Some people have a lot of money. Similarly, that's the way they get to participate. And you know, I'm not arguing in favor of that, but it's not a, it's not a crazy theory. You know? And five justices of the Supreme Court agree with it. So um, it's a really crappy position to say, hey, you know, suck it up. That's where we are. But that's basically kind of what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman over here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Andrew, uh, I'm remembering that one of the, uh, I think it was 12 suggested amendments to the Constitution in the Bill of Rights that Jefferson sent back from Paris to Madison was that we should be free of monopolies. Was he referring to corporate monopolies and perhaps seeing that we could have this problem someday? Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, I, can you restate that? Uh, well, what's the point? I don't know the answer to the question. Restate the question do know the answer. No, Jefferson on, on monopolies, uh, when there's a letter in September of uh, 1788, I guess, that he was writing to Madison with a saying, I, I largely like your work at the Constitutional Convention, um, 
but there are a couple of things that, that bother me. And uh, I don't, I, uh, that's in our book, Madison and Jefferson, and um, my mind is on the president at the moment, and I, I, I can't address your question about monopolies. You know what, oh, go ahead. We have a gentleman here, and then David Discano, yeah. Just wondering, um, concerning Jefferson, I segue. Um, constitutionally, I've, I've read before, I don't know the veracity, that Madison and Jefferson had real questions about the constitutionality of the Louisiana Purchase and whether an amendment was necessary to the Constitution. Yeah. Ultimately, from the things I've read, expediency dictated they right. had to make the deal then. And was wondering, kind of, maybe this kind of segues also into your bipartisanship idea. People don't ever seem to talk about this episode in history that at times even mo more principled individuals, and I think we all do, Jefferson as a principled person, um, did make expedient decisions in power. And why isn't this episode highlighted? Actually, uh, just, uh, just, no, you're, asking, you're asking an LSU professor, so there may be some <laughs> bias. <laughs> uh, there are a number of occasions on Capitol Hill, in the Senate and in the House, where uh, members of Congress did uh, refer to Jefferson's actions as an executive with the Louisiana Purchase. It's usually uh, to say, yes, there's precedent for our doing X, Y, or Z in foreign policy. Um, uh, so there is a, a kind of general knowledge on the Hill about that precedent. Um, and historically, it, it, it is true that Jefferson and Madison recognized, and by the way, they more or less made, uh, carried on a, a co-presidency. Um, Jefferson had been Secretary of State, Madison was his Secretary of State, though Madison had never left American shores. Um, uh, but. Uh, I think it was fair to say that there was no major decision that Jefferson made during his two terms in office where Madison wasn't uh, consulted and uh, where uh, it wasn't uh, really a joint uh, decision. And with the Louisiana Purchase, they recognized um, uh, what, the, the fear that uh, if we did not, because diplomacy took months because of how long it took to uh, for, for documents to, to go overseas and come back and get signatures. Uh, so jumping at the chance for, you know, to, to double uh, the American continent, or the American uh, territory, um, what was done because of the fear of uh, Napoleon's um, uh, unreliability that he could turn around and decide that, well, you know, I want...